The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Philippians in the third chapter and the eighth verse. The epistle to the Philippians, chapter 3 and verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. It's obvious that this verse follows on from something that goes before it. And what goes before it, of course, is the statement in verse 7, which we consider together last Sunday evening, where the apostle says, But uh, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. We considered what they were. He's just been telling us. He says, If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but down refuse that I may win Christ. We come back, in other words, once more to this extraordinary chapter, one of the most autobiographical chapters ever written by this great apostle. It wasn't his custom to talk about himself or to write about himself. He only does so when he's compelled to do so by the truth itself, as in this instance. But here he does. Why does he do it? Well, we've seen that the reason why he does it is this. He was writing to a number of Christian people in Philippi, the members of the church at Philippi. Why does he write to them? Well, there was a danger that they might be troubled, as so many of the early churches were troubled, by a teaching which was the teaching of the so-called Judaizers. These people who used to go around and address Christian people and say, yes, it's quite all right, you've believed the gospel, but it isn't enough. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to become a Jew, as it were. You've got to come back under the law. Then if you do that as well as believing, all will be well. Now, this is the trouble. In other words, the position was that these people were being confused as to what it really means to be a Christian, what a Christian really is. And it is to deal with that question that the apostle writes this particular chapter, and he tells them why he does so. He says, uh, to write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. That's why he's writing they were in grave danger. He says, if you get muddled and confused as to what it is to be a Christian, well, you'll lose everything. Christianity alone can save a man. That's why this is safe. So he writes the things that he'd often spoken to them about and may have written about before in order that he may put them in a position in which they shall be absolutely safe. And my dear friends, in my feeble way, I'm trying to do the same thing. I have only one reason for being in this pulpit, and that is that I believe and know that there is only one thing that can put a man safe for time and eternity, and that is this gospel. That's my only message. In this world of ours, as it is tonight, with life hanging upon threads, with the end nearer perhaps than we know, I don't know, but everybody's agreed that anything can happen in this world. And we're all in the midst of life in death. And we don't know what's going to happen. We may be ushered from time to eternity before we know. Well, I say that in a world like that, 
There's only one safe thing to do, and that is to be a Christian. So what can be more important than this question? What is a Christian? The apostle has told us in verse 3, we've already considered it, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit, not in buildings, though they be cathedrals. Worship God in the spirit. doesn't matter where you are. You can do that in the cathedral, but you don't have to have a cathedral to do it. It can be done on top of a mountain. It can be done in a cell. It can be done anywhere. Worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. Make our burst in him and in him alone and have no confidence in the flesh. That's a Christian. We've also considered how one becomes a Christian. Paul tells us that it happens through a man being apprehended by Christ, that Christ lays hold on him, arrests him, takes him in charge, turns him round, and he is henceforth led by him, apprehended. That's how one becomes a Christian. And then we went on to consider last Sunday night what happens to a man when he becomes a Christian. It's a very good way of telling whether we are Christians or not. What happens to a man when he becomes a Christian? Well, he undergoes a very profound change. It's not a slight or an easy thing to become a Christian. It's the biggest thing that can ever happen to a man. And when a man is a Christian, he's a new creature. He is in a new world. He sees nothing as he saw it before. That's what Paul tells us in that seventh verse. He says, you know, when a man becomes a Christian, he begins to think. He begins to count. He begins to reckon. He begins to make an assessment. He holds an audit. And what's he find? Well, he finds that he's been a victim of self-deception. Self-delusion. All the things he thought were wonderful and were a gain to him are all written off. There's nothing there. All lost. Finds his balance sheet was quite false. And he hasn't only been fooling others, still more he's been fooling himself. And he realizes that now he counts it all as loss. And still more alarming, he comes to the realization that though he's been deceiving and fooling himself and other people, he hasn't been fooling God. The heavenly accountant has got it all in the books, and the books will be produced at the end, and so he finds himself in an alarming position. And then he realizes the wonderful message of this gospel, which is that it's a gospel for paupers, for bankrupts, for people who've got nothing. Its invitation is, Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye, come to the waters, come without money and without price, eat, drink, all for nothing, by free grace of God, a message for Paul. That's the sort of thing he discovers. Well, now we've been looking at all that. But you see, the apostle doesn't stop there. He goes on. That was mainly negative, wasn't it? What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Now, that was mainly negative, and that was mainly in terms of uh, seeing the complete and utter uselessness of any religious prerogatives or advantages that we may have in and of themselves. Now, verse 7, I argue, deals specifically with the things he's just been listing. What things were gained? That's to say, uh, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews. Those things which I have counted gain, I now come to see were lost. He was dealing with those in particular. In other words, it's the old question again, you see. But the fact that you may have been brought up in a Christian country doesn't make you a Christian. The fact that you've always gone to a place of worship doesn't make you a Christian. The fact that your parents were Christian doesn't make you a Christian. That's the thing he saw. All loss. Can't rely on that. All goes out. But that was mainly negative, I say. And he was concerned there to show the futility of relying merely upon a religious background. That doesn't save anybody. That's all loss. But now... He goes on, and he becomes more positive. And in putting this positive before us, he shows us still other characteristics of this Christian life and of Christianity as a whole. And I'm going to ask you to look at them. Again, we shall be able to test ourselves. That's what I'm concerned about. 
This is a time when every man must know exactly where he stands. Are you a Christian? Are you not? Your eternal future depends upon this. Your eternal happiness depends upon it. Whether you're in Christ or whether you're out of Christ, this is the one thing that matters. Very well. As we look at what the Apostle goes on to tell us about this gospel, this Christianity, this Christian faith, we shall, I say, be enabled to examine and to test ourselves yet further. Now, what does he tell us? Well, let's look at it. Here's the first thing. He tells us that Christianity is something that should captivate us completely. It's of such a character that it's something, I say, that captivates a man entirely, completely, in the whole of his being. Now, you see, I'm putting it in those terms because I'm taking up this phrase of his in verse 12 again. I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I have been apprehended by Christ. Apprehended, laid hold of, captivated, if you like. Now then, Christianity, I say, is something that when it does lay hold on a man, oh, it lays hold of him completely. Let me show you what I mean. Do you notice the apostle's language here? Well, you do notice it, don't you? But uh, as it is here in the authorized translation, we none of us can get it fully. I read here, yea, doubtless. How can I read this? Let me try again. But uh, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. What's the meaning of this, yea, doubtless? Well, let me give you some other translations that people have suggested. The authorized version is much too weak here. The other common versions are not much better. This is what he really said. Instead of yea, doubtless, listen. But, indeed, therefore, at least, and. That's what he wrote. Another man puts it like this. Yea, indeed, therefore, at least, even. What's the matter with the apostle? Can't he control himself? Can't he write? What does what he mean? I counted them but lost. But indeed, therefore, at least, and. I counted them but lost for Christ. Yea, indeed, therefore, at least, even. What's the matter with the men? Well, I needn't explain, need I? Here's a man who's carried away. Here's a man who's writing with force and passion, with deep conviction. Forgotten all about style. It's bad style, this sort of thing, isn't it? When you just thrust out words like this, but indeed, therefore, at least even. Very poor style, isn't it? Yes, dear, but when you're moved to the depth of your being, you forget all about polishing your sentences and about beauty and style. This is just indicative of the fact that the man, I say, is feeling what he's saying with force, with passion, with profound conviction. Yea, doubtless. Now then, what does this tell us? Well, I say it tells us that he was carried away and he can scarcely express himself. He can't control his pen, as it were. He's moved, he's carried away so much. Why? Well, we deduce these points. This, you see, is experimental. The man's writing out of an experience, out of his own experience. This isn't theory. Let's get rid of the notion that Christianity is just a philosophy or a theory that a man can be interested in and take up and use up to a point and then put down. That's the opposite of Christianity. Christianity, let me remind you again, is something that takes hold of a man. You don't take up Christianity. Christianity takes you up. And if you haven't been taken up by it, I'm sorry, but you're not a Christian. If you say, oh, yes, I'm interested, I took up Buddhism once, I've now taken up Christianity, you haven't, you can't take it up. Nobody's ever taken up Christianity, he's taken up aspects of it, he's taken up a kind of Christian philosophy, you can't take up Christianity, it takes you up, and it makes you say, but indeed, therefore, at least even. Experimental. This isn't theory. Don't think of Paul writing here as a sort of literary man getting rather excited or worked up as he comes to a purple passage. No, no, he's writing literal experience. Listen to what he says. I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And that was a literal fact. 
This man, let us never forget, was a Jew. Hebrew of the Hebrews. Brought up in Tarsus. He was a free citizen of the Roman Empire. He was a very intelligent man, unusually intelligent. He had the advantage of being trained as a Pharisee, sat at the feet of Gamaliel, as he tells us, he excelled everybody, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Here's his record, and a very wonderful one it was, and he had great possibilities ahead of him. He might have become the greatest Pharisee of all times. He might have dwarfed even Gamaliel or Hillel or any one of them with his towering genius. Yes, but the men became a Christian. On the road to Damascus, Christ laid hold on him. And you know what it meant for him? It meant complete ruination of his career. It meant terrible things for him. He says, I've suffered the loss of all things. Now, this isn't just sort of literary hyperbole. He means what he says. He's speaking the literal truth. Do you know what it meant for him? The first thing that it meant for him was this. When a Jew became a Christian, his family finished with him. Blotted out his name on the book. Ostracized him completely. Regarded him as if he were dead. Nothing more terrible can happen to a man. It happened to this man. He had suffered the loss of his position in his family and the affection and the love of his own people. It always does mean that when a Jew becomes a Christian. He'd suffered that. But he'd suffered many things on top of that. Of course, he finished immediately to be a Pharisee. That came to an end. All the brilliance in the examinations, useless. Scrapped, finished. All the prospects of an elevated position, suddenly they all go. No longer a Pharisee at all. As a citizen of Tarsus, he had many special privileges, and especially as a Jew, all that was lost in exactly the same way. Well, I needn't keep you. This is the position. From having all those wonderful possibilities, he became a Christian preacher. No standing whatsoever. It was only a despised little sect. It only consisted of a handful of people. You see, there was no such thing as state religion in those days. Christianity was regarded as a very despised sect. There were no great positions to which you could aspire and go up in the hierarchy. No, no, there was no hierarchy to be had. The leaders of this were fishermen, ordinary workmen and artisans. There were nobodies. As he says in writing to the Corinthians, the off-scouring of the world. And he'd become one of them. Not only that, he'd been stripped of every penny and of everything else. He had to work with his own hands as a tent maker. He suffered indescribable persecutions. If you're interested in what happened to him, he's given, he gives us a list of it all in the second epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 11. I'm not going to read it all to you, but listen to some of the things that he did have to endure. Of the Jews... Five times received I forty stripes, save one. He was beaten with those thirty-nine stripes. Five times. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep and in journeys often and so on. Misunderstanding. Violence. Everything calculated to insult a man and to knock him down and to make him a nobody and a nothing. Cast into prison, threatened with his life. And when he was writing this very letter, he's a prisoner in Rome. He's in the hands of one of the most capricious emperors Rome ever, ever produced, the famous emperor Nero. I should have said the notorious emperor Nero. And he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He says he doesn't know at all, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. He's in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. He doesn't know. Here he is. This is the sort of thing that happened to him. You see, the man's writing out of experience. He is not merely theorizing. He's not painting a beautiful picture. This had happened to him. And it's in spite of the fact that this had happened to him that he says, yeah, doubtless, and I count all things but lust for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. It's experimental. The second thing I emphasize is this, that obviously the whole man is involved. 
Here's a man who's not only seen the Christian truth with his mind, he's felt it to the very depth of his heart. He's moved by it. He's moved emotionally. Uh, to the extent that his mind was enlightened, his heart, I say, was melted. It was moved. It was filled with a sense of rapture. He's thrilled by it. He's so carried away by it that he really, as I say, is guilty of this appalling style in writing. Christianity takes up the whole men. It isn't just something that you take in with your mind and feel nothing. And it has no effect upon your life and your will. When a man becomes a Christian, his mind, his heart, his will are all involved and all engaged. The man sees the truth. He is moved by it. His heart goes out and his will is active. And he lives to please God and to please Christ. The whole man is involved. Is your whole man involved, my friend? Do you ever produce this, yea, doubtless? Do you ever know this thrill that you feel in this man's words? This is to be Christian. And then the other preliminary point I make is this, that it's something which goes on increasing. You noticed in verse 7 he uses the past tense, what things were again to be those I counted loss for Christ. That was at the point of conversion, at the beginning. Yeah, doubtless, and I count, I still count, I am now counting. In the present, all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count, he repeats it. I deduce this principle, that this is something which increases. I counted, I saw it, but I still count it, and I count it now very much more than I did before. I count it, but yea, doubtless, now even but and... It's increasing. He's adding here to what he said before. He says that isn't enough. I counted all things but loss. I can't leave it there. If I counted it all lost there at the beginning, well, what do I say now? That's what he's saying. Yeah, doubtless. That's the meaning of the expression. In other words, my dear friends, let's be clear about this. It isn't a temporary decision. It isn't just to have some emotional excitement in a meeting and rush forward at the end and sign a paper and then wonder what you did the next morning and uh, have nothing at all to do with it, with perhaps in a week or a year's time. That's not Christianity. That's psychology. When Christianity takes hold of a man, when a man is apprehended by Christ and really belongs to him, it increases, it grows. I counted, I count, I much more count. Yea, doubtless, I'm counting more than ever, and I will. I want to go on. And on he goes, telling us, you see, that this is his ambition now, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I follow after, forgetting the things that are behind. I press. It's going on and on and on, and it's increasing from strength to strength and from glory to glory. That's Christianity. You don't resent my personal questions, do you? I assure you I ask them only because for you it is safe. And the question I ask is this. Do you know this increasing element in your Christianity? Do you think more of him now than you did when you first knew him? Is your Christian life increasingly thrilling to you? Is it more and more wonderful? Are you more and more enraptured? Or are you like so many Christians who say, oh, I wish I could get back that which I had at the beginning? So many say that it's the exact opposite of what the Apostle teaches. And it's wrong, my friends. The more you know him, the more wonderful it becomes. Be careful that you don't get confused between emotional experiences and knowing him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of the Spirit. This increases. I count and I count yea more. More than ever, it's going on and it's increasing. This is a tremendous test, this. I remember a poor man once giving his experience. And it was thought to be very wonderful, but all looking back I see how wrong it was. The man got up and he said, I decided for Christ 40 years ago. And friends, he said, I've never regretted it. Poor man. Never regretted it. What a way to talk about this blessed person and the life in which he lives. 
Oh, negative. Where's the yea, doubtless? Where's the increase? Never regret it. A man shouldn't use such language. What he should say is, I'm more and more captivated by him. It's more wonderful than when I did it. And when I believed 40 years ago, he's taken me on and changed me from glory into glory. And I'm going on until heaven I see his face. Well, now then, there are the first principles that seem to me to emerge from this matter. Christianity is something that captivates a man entirely and completely. Not only with his mind, not only with his heart, not only living a good life with his will. If the three are not involved, there's something wrong. He takes up the entire man. Let me come to a second principle. Christianity, he tells us also, makes everything else seem worthless. I'll use the authorized translation. Why shouldn't I? It's a better translation of what Paul said. Dung. Dung. Manure. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now then, what does this mean? Well, this is the great point he makes in this verse, isn't it? You see, he's advancing on what he said in verse 7. There he said, what things were gained to me, them those I counted loss for Christ. Circumcision, Hebrew of the Hebrews. Zeal, persecuting, righteousness of the law, blameless, those things. But now he goes beyond it. What am I talking about, he says. Look here, he says, this is an understatement. I must correct this at once. You're doubtless. But and even if... He throws them out, and he doesn't know where he is quite. But he must say it. He must bring it out at once. Let nobody be any misapprehension about this. Yet, yeah, doubtless, and I count all things, not only those, but all things, but loss for the excellency of Christ Jesus, my Lord. You see, he still counted. He began by counting. He goes on counting, as I say. This is something deliberate. He's not being carried away only by his feeling. He means what he says. He says, look here, I count, I've assessed this, I've gone into it with great thoroughness many, many times. And I say this, that I now reckon and count all things, everything, not only those, but everything, but loss. What's he talking about? Well, when he says all things, he means all things. Pleasures. Enjoyment of life in this world. Personal possessions. Money. Wealth. Land. Houses. He brings all that in. It's in the all things. What else? Well, still better things, still greater things. Personal qualities. Moral character. Moral integrity. What else? Gifts. Brain. Ability. Understanding, learning, knowledge, philosophy, all come in, all things. These are the things the world offers us. These are the things we get in this world. I'm just giving you a list of some of the ones that people uh, admire most of all and which they covet most dearly. These are the things. What else? Well, on top of all that, position, greatness, success, applause, the adulation of the people... These are the things for which people fight. These are the things which they covet. They give themselves to them. These are the things they say that make life worth living. These are the things that appeal to a man of ambition. He wants to rise to these great heights. The apostle faced them all. And this is his verdict. This is his calculation at the end. I count, I assess, all. Is but loss. Now the Christian is bound to do this. Did you notice the examples of that we had in our reading at the beginning out of that 11th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews? I'm trying to say this, my dear friend. A Christian is a man who's always calculating. He's the only man who thinks truly. The other man, as I say, has his false balance sheet. 
The Christian alone is a man who really knows how to assess and to make his calculations. Did you notice how we were told that at the beginning? Ah, is Abraham. He suddenly asked by God one day to take his son, his only true son, Isaac, and to go and sacrifice him on a certain mountain. By faith, Abram, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Well, what made him do it? What made Abraham go on that journey to sacrifice this son of his, this only son of his? Here's the answer. Accounting. He's an accountant, you see. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Every Christian is an accountant, and he's the only honest and the only straight accountant. He's the only man who really knows the values of things. So he accounted, and he was quite right. But then we're told the same thing about Moses. Listen. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, rather. What's choosing mean? Well, he looks at this, he looks at that. Pharaoh, son of Pharaoh's daughter. Highest in the court. Endless possibilities. As a general, as a statesman, as the greatest man in the country of Egypt. The son of Pharaoh's daughter. He looked at it. He looked at the other side. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pleasures of sin for a season. To be a nomad. To be a nobody traveling with this rabble. On the way from Egypt to Canaan and all the troubles and the problems and all those foolish people grumbling and complaining and attacking him. All that you read about the life of Moses. He saw this, he saw that. And he at once came to his decision. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What enabled him to do that? Here's the word. Esteeming. Esteeming, counting, calculating, working it out again. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And the apostle says, I'm, I'm still doing this. I, 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 I say it, is, I mean it, yet doubtless. I count all things. But loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. But he goes beyond that. He can't stop even that. He says, you know, it's not only loss, it's worse. It's dung. It's manure. It's refuse. All this that the world admires so much. To me, he says, it's refuse. On what grounds does he say this? Well, he counts, he says. It's a calculation still. He still hasn't lost his head. He's still working it out mathematically, if you like. He's really looking at the two sides. And this is his conclusion. Final sum. Now then, how does it work? It works like this. The first thing the Christian does when his eyes are opened is to see that all these things to which the world attaches so, so much significance, he sees they're not what he thought they were. The world's glittering prizes, what are they? This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. How does it do it? Well, it enables you to see things as they are. Of course, you look at the life of society as it is, dressed up in its evening dress. Marvelous, is it? You get to know them behind the scenes. You watch there looking at one another, the jealousy and the envy. Is she a better dress than I've got? Did she pay more for it? What's our position and status? Ah, oh, once you really get to know it, you see the tinsel that it is, the tawdriness of it all. It looks marvelous in the paper, in the court circular, or whenever these things appear, and as you look at them on the surface, but once you really get to know them, what is there? You see through them. And you can go into the most learned societies and you'll find the same sort of petty jealousy and envy. And the unhappiness and the misery and the rivalry at the back of it all. The Christian begins to see through these things. And that's why he begins to regard them as refuse. But he doesn't stop at that. He sees in addition to that that they've really got nothing to give to his soul. They never did have. They were all on the surface of life. All the things that the world regards so marvelous. It's nothing but a sort of suit that you put on. 
It isn't you. It's something that you put on. It's the regalia. It's a kind of gown you put on and various things on top of it and you dress yourself up. But you know, you in your skin are still the same person. These things don't touch the soul. They don't touch the real man. They've got nothing of value to contribute to a man's real existence in this world. He sees that. He hadn't seen it before. He thought they were wonderful. He now sees them for what they are and that they don't help his soul. They don't help him to live, really. You see, you can, have, you can be at the top of the list in the world and yet not really be living. There are tragedies in the top circles. In the very topmost circles, poor alcoholics, poor adulterers, and so on and so forth. These things don't help a man really to live. They give him this outward success. But what of his soul, what of his character? They don't make any contribution. And when you come to talk about dying, they don't help him at all. Maybe the greatest man in society doesn't help you to die. You may have greater knowledge than any man in England. The learning of Oxford and Cambridge doesn't give you any advantage when you come to die on your deathbed. There's nothing in the libraries that help you there. You can have all the wealth of the universe. It won't help you to cross that river. It doesn't help you at all. Doesn't help you to live, doesn't help you to die. The Christian now sees all this, the things he saw so wonderful. He says, this is nothing, it's refuse, it's no good. Well, let me sum it all up by putting it like this. He sees that none of these things can save him. And what a man finally needs is to be saved. Saved from temptation, saved from sin and evil, saved from wrong. Yes, saved from a fear of death, saved from the wrath of God against sin, saved from the law of God and its condemnation. He needs to be saved for time and for eternity. And these things make not the slightest contribution, but it's worse than that. Not only is it true to say that none of them can save me, they even hinder my salvation. Now that's why I think he changes loss into dung. It's not only that they're lost, says Paul, I count them but dung, but refuse. Why does he become so violent? Why does he become so abusive? It's all right, says somebody, to say that these things are of no value, but why does he say they're manure? I'll tell you why, here's one answer. These things not only can't save me, they are a hindrance to my salvation and to yours and to everybody else's. How well like this. They occupy my time. They occupy my thought. And while I'm giving my time and thought to the Sunday newspapers and reading the, the dramatic critic and the art critic and the music critic, wonderful culture, I'm a sophisticated man, and I then read politics and I pick up my novel and I look at my television, and while I'm doing that, I don't give a single thought to my soul. I don't contemplate the fact that I, like everybody else, have got to die and to stand before God in the judgment. They so take my time and thought and attention that they positively are the greatest hindrances to my salvation. Not only that, you see, they distract my attention in that way. No thoughts of God, I've no time, no thoughts for the soul. And in any case, they ridicule all that. People like this don't believe in that, so they discourage me from thinking of God and my soul. And then on top of it all... They give me a false sense of satisfaction. They give me a false sense of contentment. I'm getting on. I'm doing well. Isn't life wonderful? I'm all right now. I'm all right when I come to retire. Everybody's pleased with me. Look at my learning, my knowledge. I'm in the smart set. I'm accepted in the cultural circles. Why, word, I've done well. Fancy my coming to this point from where I began. Yes, it makes me self-satisfied. I'm contented. Everything's all right. I sit back. And while they give me that false contentment and satisfaction, I have not a single thought about my soul. If the bum were let loose tonight, I wouldn't be ready. I wouldn't know anything. I wouldn't know where I am. I wouldn't know God. I wouldn't know Christ. I wouldn't know what to do nor where to turn. These things, they've robbed me. They're refuse. They're done. They're manure. I hate them. That's what he's saying. It isn't simply that they're lost. They're a positive hindrance. 
You see, it is these things that are standing between the world tonight and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's why people are not listening to this gospel at this moment. It's these other things that are captivating them. They're of hell, I say. They're refuse. They're dung. They're not only worthless, they're worse than that. They're putrefaction. They're the enemy of my soul. They stand between me and the glory of God. That's the second thing he says, therefore. Christianity is something that captivates a man entirely. It's something that makes a man feel that everything else is loss and refuse and dung and utterly worthless. Let me give you my last principle. Why does Christianity make us feel like that about everything? Why did Paul say that he counts all things but loss? Yea, even as dung. What makes him say that? What makes every Christian say that? Because it does, my friend. If a man's a true Christian, he must say this. Why? It's of necessity. Paul can't help himself. Yea, doubtless. What is it? Well, I'll tell you. It is the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's that, you see, that gives a value to everything else. You've got to have your standard, you've got to have your touchstone. And what he says is this, you know, once I saw the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, I've seen everything else differently, everything, all things, and it's become done. Why, well, it's the contrast with the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's been accounting, he's been estimating, he's been esteeming, he's been doing what all these great saints have done throughout the centuries. This is the thing that makes them vagabonds, as it were, and prefer to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. What is it? Well, how can I hope to answer that question at ten to eight? We ought to stay here till midnight, and then I wouldn't have started. There's no end to it. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. What's he mean? Well, let me give you some headings. And if you really are a Christian, I'll tell you this. You'll, be go, you'll go on thinking about these headings, not only for the rest of your life, but throughout the whole of eternity. You'll just be working out my headings tonight. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. My Lord, the person, the person himself, who is he? The Lord, the Lord of glory, the Son of God, who was ever in the eternal bosom. You, who want to meet great people, you, who regard it as the height of your ambition to get into certain circles, and will spend money and give yourselves and to do anything in order to get there and to know people. Here's a message that will introduce you to the Lord of glory, the Son of God, the one who is the brightness of his image and the express brightness of his glory and the express image of God's person, the Lord, the Lord. The Lord of heaven. You can know him through this gospel. And Paul had met him on the road to Damascus. And one glimpse of him had made everything else appear like manure. There was never anyone like him. The face, the glory, the person, son of God, Lord of creation. You get to know the person. You can't talk about anything else after this. If you've ever met him, my dear friend... Oh, other people are all right, but you don't get excited about them. There's only one. To me, to live, he's already said, is Christ. Because he is who and what he is. But then listen. Secondly, what he's done. Now, this is most wonderful. What has he done, this Lord of glory? Well, the apostle has already answered that question in the second chapter of this great epistle. Let this mind be in you, he says, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
Look for a moment with me at what he's done, this blessed person. Do you know what he's done? Well, this is a most amazing thing, this. The Son of God, the Lord of glory, did in the glory the very thing that the apostle tells us that he began to do after he met him on the road to Damascus. He counted. I read to you now from the authorized version. It puts it like this. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery. Actually the apostle used exactly the same word as he uses three times in verses 7 and 8 of this third chapter. Translated here very rightly. Count. So that I read again. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God counted it not robbery to be equal with God. Which means this. Didn't esteem it, didn't account it, didn't regard it as a prize to be held on to. He was in the form of God. He was equal with God. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal and co-eternal. He didn't count that as something that he must hold on to at all costs. What did he do then? No, no, he said, for the sake of these people whom I'm going to save, I will not count in that way. I won't hold on to it. I decide that I lay aside the signs of my glory and my Godhead. And I will go down into the world and I'll be born out of a virgin's womb as a helpless little babe. And I'll be born in terrible poverty. Though I own everything and I've created everything. I'll be penniless, I'll be helpless, I'll have nothing. I'll be a helpless babe. He counted that for our sakes he wouldn't hold on to that. But that he'd lay it aside. So, you see, this is what he's done. This is the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love to tell the story which angel voices tell, how once the King of glory came down on earth to dwell. The excellency of the knowledge. Where are you sophists, you philosophers, you men of knowledge and of learning? Where have you ever found anything like this? The Son of God, the Lord of glory, came down on earth to dwell. He counted, he made a calculation. He decided deliberately, esteeming that it was worth it. He'd lay aside all this in order to come down on earth. What did he come down for? Well, to become Jesus. Christ Jesus, my Lord, the Lord, became Jesus. He became a man, but he didn't stop at that. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, still further, deliberately, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He knew he was going to do it before he left heaven. That's what he had to balance the glory that he had against what he'd have to endure and suffer. But he came and he went right through with it. He despised the shame, as we are told in Hebrews 12:3. He made another calculation. So he despised the shame, the agony, the suffering. He came down. He did it all. What for? That you and I might be saved that you and I might be made safe. He came down and went to that cross in order to bear your sins and mine. He took our guilt upon him. That's what he was doing. He suffered God's wrath upon our sin. God smote him. God struck him. He died. He was buried. Even the death of the cross, he'd worked it all out. He'd made his calculation. He said, I'll do it. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. You are interested in drama and like to be moved by great drama. Have you ever seen anything like this? You'll never look at another drama once you've seen this. It's all here, infinitely more, everything. But then let me go on to another heading. Consider what he gives us. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. What does he give us? He gives us knowledge of God. He introduces us to God and to God's great way of salvation. Now let me summarize this by putting it as the opposite of the things that Paul used to want so much. What did he want? Well, this. Touching the righteousness which is in the law. Blameless. He wanted to be a righteous man. And now he's found it. 
and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He'd been very proud of his own little righteousness. Once he sees this, that's done. He's not interested any longer. That's mine own righteousness, which is after the law. He was very proud of his circumcision also. But he realized, didn't he, after meeting Christ, that it was only a circumcision in the flesh? Now, in this excellent knowledge that he's found in Christ, he's obtained a circumcision of the heart. It's no longer the flesh, it's the heart. He's got a new heart, he's got a clean heart. Christ circumcises the heart and not merely the flesh. What else was he interested in? Well, birth. Oh, uh, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. No ordinary tribe, you see. The tribe of Benjamin, the same as Saul, the first king of Israel. He traces his ancestry, his lineage, back to the royal family, the first king of Israel. Benjamin and Hebrew, of the Hebrews. He thought that was marvelous. He now regards it as a manure heap. Why? Oh, because he's had a new birth. He's been born again. And not of the flesh any longer, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. He's born of the Spirit. He's born from above. He's born of heaven. He's a new man. He's got a new family. Who's his father? God. Who's his brother? Christ, Lord of glory. The man who was so proud of his family connections, of his particular section of it, the fact that he was a Hebrew, here he suddenly finds in this excellent knowledge that he's made a child of God, a member of the royal family of heaven, and has as his relatives the Godhead itself. Christ is not ashamed to call him a brother. God is not ashamed to call him one of his people. And on top of it all, the glorious hope. Because as a child of God, he's an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. And there's an inheritance waiting for him. He was interested in money and in possessions and in status and position and free men of Tarsus, a free man of the Roman Empire. Now there opens before him a vista of glory and he's going to inherit it. He's going to live in it. He's going to reign in it with Christ. No, he not. He says that the saints shall reign and rule over the earth and reign over angels. All this is given to him. This is the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And having seen this, he regards everything else as a manure heap, dung and refuse. And when he considers to whom it's given, he doesn't know what to say. That's why he says, yea, doubtless, and throws out his butsy fans, perhaps. He's lost. Why? Well, all this is given to him. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was a rebel. He was against God and Christ. Suddenly it's all given to him for nothing. Oh, what an excellent knowledge. And having seen all this, he says, yea, doubtless, I count all things but lust for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Don't talk to me about anything else, he says. Indeed, he says that to the Galatians, let no man trouble me any longer. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Leave me alone, he says. I don't want anything else. I'm not interested. Christ, to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It's to be with Christ, which is far better. Christ is the beginning, is the end, the alpha, the omega, the first, the last. He's the all and in all. For in him I have had wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, everything. Everything, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He is a man who says, Jesus, I, my cross, have taken all to leave and follow thee. Destitute, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my all shalt be. Perish every fond ambition, all I thought and hoped and known. Yet how rich is my condition, God and heaven. 
are still my own. What about you, my dear friend? Do you count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus? Do you? If you don't, there's only one explanation. You don't know the truth about yourself, and you know the truth about him still less. When a man knows the truth about himself, he very soon decides it's loss. When he has some glimmering of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, his Lord, it's not only loss, it's dung, it's refuse. Do you count, account, esteem all things but loss for him? Consider him again. Turn to him. Ask him to manifest himself to you. Plead God to enlighten you by the Holy Spirit until you've had a glimpse of him. For once you've seen him. You're bound to say this. Nothing else is possible. Because of the excellency of the knowledge concerning him, everything else becomes lost. And then you'll be ready to join Thomas Oliver's, the author and composer of that first hymn we sang, and you'll say without any hesitation, I all on earth forsake its wisdom, fame, and power, and him my only portion make, my shield and power. Are you ready to forsake the whole world for his sake? My dear friend, it's the only safe thing to do. But oh, the excellency of the knowledge, oh, the rewards that come, oh, the riches of his grace, oh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Passing knowledge, the knowledge of God, who is able to do for us exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Turn to him. Don't give yourselves any rest until you've known him, whom to know is life eternal, and the excellency of knowing whom makes everything else loss, indeed, refuse. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.